Hello and welcome to the Haughty Culturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I'm Chili Matthew Lucas, and we do post every week, so hit subscribe if you want to follow our continuing adventures. Yes, what a good idea. And this week, Stephen. our adventure is... Yes. We're going to talk about colourful twigs. <laughs> <laughs> colourful twigs, but not just any colourful twigs or twigs that you've painted, because we have covered you painting. Yeah, twigs. yes, I, I do cheat occasionally. No, we're going to talk about twigs that are naturally coloured that can give interest and effect in the winter garden. Because that's the thing. Winter, I guess here in Australia, we don't have such severe winters no. as North America and Europe and other parts of the world. So it's not such an issue for us because no. there is other things going on. But particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, having colour in late autumn and winter is really important. And yeah. those structural things can do amazing things in the garden. Yeah. yeah, and the thing they can do that we can't do often is they can have bright red dogwood twigs with snow, <laughs> yeah, oh, which, <laughs> which is... I love the effect. I mean, it's just so incredible, that contrast of the pure white snow and these brilliant red canes. We could probably only do it if we threw a whole pile of polystyrene oh, beads around. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> All right, well, here we are in your nursery, Dixonia yep. Red Plants, and we're going to take a look at some things which have amazing, colourful stems, yes. which you can use to create and design your winter garden. Yeah, so come with me. I'm the branch manager. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness, that's a bad dad joke. <laughs> All right, the first cab off our coloured stem rank. All right, well, this is a Japanese wine berry. Oh, and it is beautiful. We'll come and take a close up of the stem because yeah. that's the whole point. It's got the most beautiful red, furry, and slightly prickly. Yes, stem. yes, so it's a rubus, so it's a blackberry relative. Yep. It does have edible berries, albeit small, and it makes a big uh, arching mound. And if you take all the old canes out every year and encourage all the fresh young canes, then in the winter you'll have these beautiful red, bristly, prickly canes to entertain you for the winter. Just a point of warning though, if it hits the ground, it will, like a normal commercial blackberry, send down roots, and this one's obviously been touching the ground at some point, and start the next one. Well, there you go. Well, so, this is the, the wheel of commerce turning in front of us. <laughs> yeah, well, it is rather, Pop yes. that baby up. <laughs> yes. So just to clarify then, it's only the first year growth that has the coloured stems. Once mm. the stems mature, they become dull and boring. They do, uh, but they do flower and fruit. <laughs> ah, so if you want that, you have to leave the canes. If you want the colour, then you treat it as an ornamental and you don't worry about the blackberries. And I might add the fruit is small and the flowers are not particularly large either. Right. So, so you'd, if you want the fruit, you'd go down the fruiting blackberry yeah, yeah, um, route. Exactly. If you want to source this plant, you'll need to, well, you might find it has Japanese wineberry. It's a good common name and it's quite acceptable. But it's botanically known as Rubus phanocalasius. Rubus phanoclassius. I won't even begin. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not even sure. What it, I'm not actually Who sure cares? what it Who means cares? either. But can I also just say, though, that the autumn leaves are a very beautiful sort of limey yellow. Yep. And then in contrast to the stem, it's brilliant. Now then, let us just think about the blackberry family yeah. and how, what's the word that we can use? Vigorous. Yes, vigorous is. is a good word. How are you going to use these cultivars in the garden and manage them and enable you to kind of uh, benefit from the beauty of the stems? Right. Well, certainly pruning out the old stems is, is the crucial thing. That's yeah. the main thing you've got to do. You also don't want to encourage it necessarily to hit the ground. So what I normally do is I go in close to the plant and I will tie the stems together so that they come up and they arch over, but they don't get to the ground. So like a fountain. Yes, exactly. And if you plant them then where they get direct winter sunlight on them to make them glow, mm. because if they're in the shade, the red color doesn't tend to stand out so well. And then basically treat them like you would any other blackberry or raspberry, really. Mm. All right, so if you were not in possession of a large estate, as Jane Austen may have said. Can you grow these in pots and use them as a winter specimen plant? Look, you probably could, but you'd need to repot them comparatively frequently because they've got vigorous roots. Ah, uh, right, right, right. So probably every couple of years at the absolute minimum, mm. you'd need to break them up, replant them as fresh plants, or take young layers and grow them on. Older plants wouldn't actually work terribly well in a pot, I don't think. Right. Now, if we're considering the garden environment, uh, where are you going to plant this? 
if you're going to use it, you've obviously got to use it where it is in isolation uh, with perhaps a background behind it because you don't want other things coming up and growing through right. it. Mm. So to see it at its best in the winter, it needs to be on its own. So that's going to be then towards the front of a bed or a border. And so would you recommend then having something evergreen as the backdrop to it or...? You could have something evergreen, but I think it would actually stand out rather well, say, against a white timber wall. or So it wouldn't necessarily have to have a plant-based background for it. Right. And in fact, many coloured twigs will stand out really well against, in fact, uh, a blank surface like a white wall. Mm. So, you know, you could go down that path. Uh, and in fact, you could use the uh, the uh, wall to sort of lift the plant and tie it back to it a bit so that mm. you could virtually espalier it against a white wall, which could be rather fun. It would. It would look beautiful. So other than the, the pruning back then, fairly low maintenance. Yeah, yeah. Once a year, prune all the old stems out. Make sure that you deal with any babies that have managed to form on the ends of the stems. <laughs> yeah, really not that hard to grow. And anywhere you can grow a classical blackberry or a raspberry, you should be able to grow a Japanese wineberry. And it would look great in a snowy environment. It certainly would. All right, well, from the Japanese wineberry, which is from Japan, <laughs> <laughs> let's go and look at something else with beautiful coloured stems. What a good idea. Let's go. Stephen, this... Now, I... I did actually just think it had some kind of mouldy fungal yeah. problem. <laughs> this oh, is charming. the most amazing stem. Yes. Well, this is yet another one of the blackberries or rubuses. Right. And it's commonly known as a ghost bramble. Uh, Wonder why. Yeah. And there's three or four species that all do this white caney thing. Yeah. Uh, I got this one as rubus leucodermis, which means white. Skin. skin. I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, yes, you're getting better and better. Unfortunately, I don't think it is leucodermis, although whether that's unfortunate, I'm not sure. Mm. I think I've pinned it down to Rubus tibeticus. Right. Um, so a Tibetan Rubus. It's a wild species, as is the Japanese wineberry. They're all wild species. Are they? These, these so are not selections. These are naturally how they look in the wild. Ah, right, right, right. Mm. Um, just stunning. So as we can see, it's got the most beautiful silvery stem. Yeah. But you were making the point before that there are really three groups of plants you're essentially looking at in yep. terms of the colourful winter stem world, which are? Which are? Well, Rubus, obviously, yes. uh, number one. Uh, and there's two other genera that we're going to cover. One is the Salix genus, the willows, yep. because there's many willows that have very attractive stems. And the final one we're going to look at are, in fact, the coloured stemmed cornices, the dogwoods. Mm. But we'll get to those in a yep. minute. And I guess the other thing to point out, although this is all about winter stems, is that, of course, winter bark is a whole other story uh, yes. of the trees you can use so yep. we won't go into the trees at this point we might no. do another episode about yeah that. well i think that's a good idea and of course the thing about stems from a gardener's perspective is that stems are that color from the first year and in fact many of them you need first year wood yeah. whereas when you plant a tree like a birch or something like that that has lovely bark it often takes a decade or more before it starts showing its characteristics mm. so this is for the impatient gardener that wants immediate <laughs> impact so there you go. So we, we looked at the, the Japanese wineberry. Wineberry. Yeah. Now, would you need the same care? Is it the first year growth that has the stems, then they mature, lose their colour, but flower and berry? Yes. So the same cycle. Same cycle as the red stemmed one. Mm -hmm. So with this one, you need to remove its old canes uh, each year. You encourage all the new canes that come up and take the old ones out. And you generally do all that pruning, which you do with most of the things I'm talking about, yeah. at the end of winter, because you don't want to remove the canes that you've got on the plant that are looking nice this year that won't look good next year until the now season you said moves that, on. That is so obvious, but <laughs> that's a very good point to make. So same growing conditions, they're all going to need full or mostly, mostly full sun. Mostly sun. Um, but of course, the red stems of the wineberry uh, do better with a pale background behind them. Mm. The white stems of this would do far better if they had a dark background. So Matthew needs to stand in uh, in the frame the whole time. So if you've got a really dark background behind it, perhaps a, um, fence. a fence or Shed. a dark hedge, like a yew hedge or something like ah, that, right. these sorts of plants would stand out really well against a dark background. Yeah. So planting them, it's about placing them in the right place and getting the right effect. And of course, many of these coloured stem things can actually be grown 
in beds where they're all there together so that you get that mixture of red and white and yellow and all the different coloured stems uh, so that you get a serious winter effect. Beautiful. Now yours is sort of lolling a little bit through a tree. Yeah. Um, is, it, is this a particularly large piece? Because it looks to me as though it might be a bit bigger or is that just yeah, it is a bit bigger right. uh, and it is a little more difficult to manage well uh, I think if I could get the third of the trio of colored uh, white stemmed brambles mm. uh, which is Rubus cockburnianus but as far as I know it's not in the country it's actually a much shorter uh, more upright sort of shrubby form which would actually be far easier to manage and I know it's a very common garden plant in Europe and so you're very lucky because I can't get Rubus cockburnianus here and I have to do with the one I've been able to get which is Tibeticus. Tibeticus so from Tibet I'm assuming then obviously hardiness is not an issue yeah. Heat though? It'll cope with a fair bit of heat as long as it's got moisture at the roots, mm. but again, it's not a plant for tropical climes, mm. so it doesn't like that tropical humidity. Are there any rubus that are native to the tropics? Do you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, rubus is a big genus, it's got probably hundreds of species, oh, right. and there's rubus that come from Malaya, there's rubus that come from all over the place, uh, Central America. Uh, we have some of our own natives, although most of ours come from cooler and more Mediterranean style climates. Mm. And there's even some Alpine ones. So there's Rubuses almost everywhere. Almost everywhere. All right, well, we're gonna leave Rubus behind now yes, and, and look at on. another group of colorful stemmed plants. What a good idea. Off we go. Um, we're now going to look at a couple of the different willows that one can grow for, in fact, colored stems. And so here the they are. second of the group, so we've looked yep. at Rubus the first group now we're looking at willows the second group yep. so, so we've got two here two here now that's a black caned willow quite obviously and believe it or not that stem has been dead for about 10 years what and sitting in a vase in my lounge room looking seriously gothic with a whole pile of other ones wow so dried flower work there you go another mm. possibility so clearly then we're using this for um the black stem yep now the issue with willows is are they not generally a tree Yes, although these ones probably couldn't be classed as truly large trees. Mm. I mean, willows do vary. There are large tree willows, there are shrubby willows, which still can get to four or five metres, a lot of them. Yeah. And then there's the little dwarf willows, which are often from the uh, Arctic tundra, places like Kamskatcha and all those sort of exotic places in the world. Okay. Uh, so there are three major groups in the willow genus. Yeah. And these ones are both in what you'd class as the shrubby-ish willows. So that brings us to the question, with Rubus we saw that it's the first year's new growth that gives mm. you the colour, so what about willows? It's basically the same issue, mm. it's the younger canes that have the best colour. Uh, certainly with the black caned willow, uh, it very quickly goes grey in older stems, so you lose the colour. Right. And the same with this white caned willow as well, mm. it will go grey quite quickly, so you do need to coppice these on a fairly regular basis. Alright, so we'll get to coppicing in a minute. Now, did we give the name of this one, Stephen? No, we didn't. This is uh, Salix mercinifolia, and it's a European native willow. It would be useful for basket weaving, all sorts of things. Whipping. And as I, <laughs> whipping. And as I've mentioned, of course, it is very useful for floral art because the stems dry black. Why not indeed plant a black stemmed willow? So let's talk about coppicing then. So for those that don't know, coppicing is... Well, it's basically taking a tree down to a stump, uh, basically the same height each time, so that you control the potential growth over the next 12 months. Mm. And so you know more or less what to expect of those plants each year. In the case of this one, if you've got a well-established plant and you coppice it regularly, it will send up fabulous jet black canes of around about three metres every year. So it's an annual task, the coppicing yep. of, you mm. couldn't, well, if you skip a year, they're just going to start to yeah, mature. You'll, yeah, and you'll have shorter new growth, which won't be as dramatic. But if you do miss it, you know, for some whatever reason, if you have an older plant, if you just, you know, get brutal and hack it right back, is it going to respond to yeah. that and its new growth will ping and yep, it'll, be, it'll fine. be fine? I mean, it's not one of those things you have to be religious about if you, you know. Or overly if, careful. Yeah, or overly careful. Look, okay. if, you, if you go overseas for the winter and you don't get round to dealing with it, well, you can do it next year. The world um, won't end. So it's not gonna matter. Now, this one, so yes. what is the name of this one? Well, this one is Salix irrorata, and this one, or irratum, I think it is, uh, this one comes from North America. And that white bloom on the stem, it's actually called a blue willow. That white bloom is actually rubbable, offable. 
So if ah, you do that, yeah, you can yeah, see yeah. it comes off. It doesn't grow back again, so don't do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> We've uh, just ruined this plant. Yeah. So this particular one has quite narrow leaves. Uh, its foliage is slightly grey green in the summer. Mm. And this one has just got its buds starting to swell. It gets the most fabulous golden catkins in the late winter. Does it? And so it's worth growing for that alone. Now, this is the one that you've got in your garden, is it not? Yes, this is so the one by my back pond. We've got footage of that one right now. So it's lost its leaves, but you can see its stems. You've got it by water. Now, willows, um, from my very limited understanding, <laughs> yes. are a tree or a, a shrub that do like to be nearer water yep. or to be moist. Is that yep. true oh, yes. for both but, of these? Yep. All the willows, as far as I'm aware, uh, are all water loving. Uh, and will generally grow in on the edges of water courses, mm. on the edges of dams. So in low-lying places where there's high water tables, they love water. So there you go. So in terms of then using these two in the garden, yours is next to a pond. So it's got sort of naturally a weeping, slightly draping habit. Well, so it sort of hangs out. It doesn't really weep so much, but it sort of hangs out. Lols. And therein is another little thing that is well worthwhile knowing. Yes. If you can plant any of these coloured stem things near a body of open water, yeah. you get double value because you get the reflection of the stems in the water as well as the actual stems themselves. Stephen Ryan, the poet. My <laughs> God, the visual poet. Yeah, so there you go. So consider that as well. So if you've got an open body of water, I mean, if it's covered in water lilies or whatever, well, it's not going to work. But mm. if it's an open body of water, then the stems will reflect in the water. And I think that's a great way of using them. So the only things really then to consider recapping is that you've got to coppice the willows every year. Yep. They do need to be moist, either near water sources or in a very mm. moist area. Um, and then hardiness wise, they're as tough as nuts. Yeah, there's again, no they're not issue. tropical plants, but mm. they'll grow in virtually any climate as long as there's adequate water there. There you go. So beautiful. So there we go. We have black, we have silver, yep. we have the beautiful red of the Japanese rubus before. So is it now time to go and look at the third group of plants? Oh yes, the third group of the plants, which are one of my favourites. They are. You might even have the National Collection. I could have. Let's go and have a look. All right, let's go. <laughs> Now, Matthew, here we are with one of my favourite groups of plants, yes. the cornice. Yes, which there's a notice by the front of your nursery saying you hold the National Collection. I do, for an organisation called Plant Trust, which there you is are. an Australian-based organisation that registers collections. So but there you go. we will come and do a whole cornice epic because yeah. it will be an epic, because how many have you got? I think there's nearly 50 in my collection <gasps> now. My goodness me. Anyway, well, let's limit ourselves yeah, yeah, to the to cornice this. with colour stems. So this yeah. is the third group of yeah. plants in a, in a colourful, twiggy, shrubby kind of... Yes, in our epic. On epic. That. Yes. And these ones, like the willows, come from riparian areas. So they grow along the what sides What do you mean, of... riparian? What's riparian mean? Stream sides and river sides. I have never heard that before. Oh, here, here I am throwing out I know, all of this. It sounds like I swallowed a thorth. It sounds like a, a, a group of people in Star Trek, the, yeah. the Riparians. <laughs> yes. Anyway, so, anyhow, so they distracted. come from damp sites. They like damp soil. So yep. that's the main thing to keep in mind. Mm. So are, not dissimilar to the willows. Yep. Same as the willows. And there's a range of different forms available. But the basic colours of these different ones, and most of them are superior selections. They're not wild forms yeah so this one with the lovely red stems is believe it or not elba which means white yes <laughs> siberica which means that it was probably discovered in siberia the elba comes from the fact that it gets white fruit so ah. it's got nothing to do with the colored stems right. so it's a little bit confusing to people who have a modicum of latin elba siberica red stem dogwood grows to about two or so metres tall, mm -hmm. coppice it at the end of winter every year or two, mm -hmm. can, you can get away with every second year. Mm -hmm. And with it growing in the same area is the yellow stem dogwood, which is a different species. Um, this is Cornus sericea, and it's the yellow form is called Flaviromia, flavour being yellow. So That's the, right, I, I vaguely remember that from something else yeah. that we've covered. And so I plant them together so that I get the combination of coloured stems. And if you look really closely behind us, there's a very tall one, which is the wild form of Sericea. So that's the wild form. The yellow stemmed one is a selection thereof. It, excellent. Now, have you been religiously coppicing these every year? No, I didn't do them last winter 
things got out of hand. I don't quite remember why, but mm. anyhow, I didn't get round to do it them was last COVID, winter. The COVID winter. Yeah, you can see where the older stems are starting to lose their colour. So it is imperative that I actually deal with these at the end of this winter. Mm. So they do need to be cut down. And I might add the the dross that I create afterwards can go through the shredder for mulch. Um, you can it, weave some baskets. Yes. Well, mm. I don't know how well the colour stays in them though as they dry. Ah, so they may point. not stay red. If we think of your willow in your garden, you can see here where you have coppiced it. Yes, yes. So you can see the original coppicing that I did a couple of years back. And why aren't you going to be doing it again? There is an issue because a lot of plants have grown up around it. Willows need lots of light. If I coppice it down again, there's a very good chance it's going to die because it won't be able to get back up into the light again. So unless I remove the plants around it, I'm probably going to have to enjoy the twigs higher up on the plant. This is, I mean, up close, it looks like the most beautiful sort of Chinese lacquer. It's an incredible mm. red. Yeah, it's a lovely plant. So any other than sort of high level care tips? Um, no, not particularly. Hardiness? Um, yeah, hardiness again, not tropics, but practically anywhere else where you've got lots of water. Mm -hmm. uh, they certainly don't want to dry out. And I guess the only other thing I'd like to say about them is the flowers of this group of dogwood are particularly boring. The fruit is also not all that interesting, mm. but they often colour well in the autumn. So the red stemmed one actually goes a wonderful burgundy before it sheds its leaves. Right. And the yellow stem one, rather appropriately, goes bright golden yellow. So you get these fabulous autumnal colours from them. Mm. So they do in fact give you more than just their stems in the winter. What's and there's a donkey in the background. <laughs> I was just wondering, what is that noise? It's a donkey, goodness yeah, me. Yeah, that's are... a donkey called Star who lives in a paddock just two doors up from my nursery. <gasps> I was distracted by the donkey. So what were you just saying? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess my observation is then that these shrubs, which they are, because you coppice them, are not doing their thing in spring, summer when most other things are, because the, the summer leaves, the flowers, are not that great. So you've got to think about where you're going to put them yeah. so that it is all about them in winter. Yes, exactly. So they need to be... Or uh, autumn as yeah, they're following. Yeah, as they're going to colour. Yeah. The other thing you've got to remember, of course, is if you're coppicing them, they're not actually going to be all that much even in evidence during the spring and early summer because they'll still be just coming up out of the ground again. Ah, so after pruning, they take some months before they start to refurbish in size. Mm. And that's actually one interesting thing. This one's become twiggy because it wasn't done last year. When I coppice it, Next winter, it will be a whole pile of bright red fishing rods. There won't be the side branches involved. Yeah, so that makes them quite sculptural, which is kind of perhaps easier in terms of how you're going to imagine yeah. where they're going to go in the garden. And yeah. height-wise in that first year? They can still get up to full size. Uh, or more or less. So they'll right. still get up to the two quick, metres or so. Quick growers. Uh, so they're, they're quite fast growing. You've got to remember when you do copper something down, it's not about restricting its size because you've got a big root system under the plant. So what's actually going to happen right. is it's invigorating. Got more and more energy to Yeah, so push it up. zooms out of the ground and you end up with this really ah, strong biomass coming up. That's interesting. I hadn't realised that. Now you've said it, it's obvious that mm. its root system gets bigger and bigger year on year on. It's yep. just the top bit you're removing. Yep. So in terms of that then, in terms of the bigger the biomass, do you need to any sort of particular fertilizing mulch? You don't need to, but having said that, all of these cornices, because they often grow in floodplains and things on the sides of streams and rivers and things, mm. when a river overflows, the water will flow through the stems of these. It will leave behind lots of sediment. Mm. So they get lots of silty, sedimenty stuff around them in their natural habitat. Yeah. And in fact, their whippy stems are interesting because if a flood comes through, they bend over to the ground. As soon as the flood's gone, they bounce back again. Interesting. So it's all part of the adaptation of these plants for their natural environment. There you go. Well, I think we have covered winter sticks 101, about one, two, three. Yeah. That was With so, lots of them. That was so interesting. They are beautiful. And all of them sort of not dissimilar in terms of their key habits. And the real, I guess the issue is just to really think about how you can maximize seeing mm. the color in winter. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's twigs, it's not big bold, yep. lousy flowers. So you do have to back them in some You've way or another that about, works. Yeah, what the backdrop is. Unless, of course, you're in deep snow where they will just look fantastic, yeah. but you're yeah. not. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I'm so jealous of that. But anyhow, <laughs> what can I do? Well, Stephen, I have loved our colourful twigs. What could we do next week? Goodness only knows, but we will move on to something else. And because it is sort of winter-esque, it'll possibly be a winter-type topic. Who knows? So you'll have to subscribe to find out what that might be. We post every week and we look forward to seeing you next week, do we not? We do indeed. See Bye all. Week.